All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Reimagine Theater, a panel series that brings artists and community leaders together to envision a new theatrical world. My name is Nebra Nelson, and I'm the Director of Arts Engagement at Seattle Rep. I'll give a brief physical description of myself for blind and low vision attendees. I am a lighter skinned woman with short brown hair and a mauve shirt. And behind me is a white, white uh, wall with a black and white photo. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people here in Seattle, including the Duwamish people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land we are on. And if you wanna learn more about our local tribes, resources and ways that you can support, uh, you can visit the land acknowledgement page on the Seattle Rep website. I want to Take a moment to thank everyone who is participating in our democracy and making their voice heard in advance of this important election. If you are able to vote, please make sure to vote and to have a voting plan in advance of November 3rd. I deeply appreciate every one of these panelists being here to have this conversation today as all and many of them are deeply participating in our democracy in advance of this election. We are doing these panels so that we can envision what a future of equity and justice looks like and how the arts and theater should be a part of that and be a consistent part of community voice. So the leading questions for this discussion are, if you could wave a magic wand and build a new theater landscape, what would you create? What is a theater landscape in which uh, theater is integrated into civic life and civic practice is integrally a part of theater. What is our vision for the future of our country and how can theater be a part of that? And what does theater at the heart of public life look like? People in the Zoom audience who are joining us directly, please think about your answers to these questions since we are going to invite you to be a part of the conversation at the end and join the discussion act actively. In the meantime, you can react to what folks are saying and ask questions and be an active part of the conversation in the chat box. This is for you, especially this panel about civic theater. So please put your thoughts in the chat you, are, you all are at the center of this conversation. So now I'm going to pass it to my co-facilitator, Inji Camel, for, the, for this panel and for the rest of the panelists to introduce themselves. Thank you, Nabra. Um, hi friends, my name is Inji Camel, and I am the director of the Public Works Program at Seattle Rep. I am a 40 something year old uh, light-skinned woman with short graying curly black hair, a black blouse, and I'm sitting in front of a white wall with a picture on a table of um, an open highway in a stormy, on a stormy day. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off to the next person to introduce themselves and we'll get through all the panelists and then we'll start the discussion. Um, uh, Miki, why don't you go next? And then you can hand it off to somebody when you're finished introducing yourself. Um, my name is Miki Kusanose. Um, I am an 18-year-old student um, at Newport High School. I'm a senior. Um, I uh, am light-skinned. I have short black hair. I'm wearing a maroon shirt. Might not look so maroon in the camera, but I'm wearing a maroon shirt. Um, and I have a poster of a cartoon tiger uh, in my wall, Calvin and Hobbes. Um, I'll pass it off to Kathy. Hi, my name is Kathy Sha. I am the Culture Partnerships and Grants Manager with the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture by Day, and I manage a women-run Asian American theater company called Cis Productions in my spare time, as well as being a theater artist. Um, I am a uh, you, she, her pronouns, and I have um, pinkish cream colored uh, skin tone. Uh, my hair is uh, past my shoulder length and black, um, and it's got weird kind of curly cues today. Um, it's pulled back uh, at the top. Um, I am wearing a black sweater. 
I have almond shaped eyes um, and uh, I have uh, in, in, in front of a wheat colored wall that's pretty bare, but I have a uh, cream colored cat stand to my left and on it is a, uh, a dark vase with um, uh, what's called a spider plant, but it basically look, looks like uh, a fountain of green and white cascading um, fronds, um, grassy fronds. Um, and I will pass it on to Manny. And Manny's I did that it. again, I forgot to <laughs> unmute. Hello and thank you, Kathy. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Manny Kowalian. I am the executive director of Inspire Washington, which is our state's uh, uh, cultural advocacy organization for science, heritage, and arts programming. Uh, my pronoun is he, him. Um, I am a Filipino American male, Pacific Islander. I have black glasses. I need a haircut. Um, I have a goatee and I have a, a medium length uh, dark hair. I'm wearing a, a navy blue sweater. Um, I'm uh, in front of a background of, that's uh, kind of cluttered with a lot of little tchotchkes. Uh, it's a white wall with two uh, white pillars um, and hanging from the ceiling um, are um, these star-shaped objects with white translucent shells that are actually called copy shells because they come from the province in the Philippines where my mother is from. Um, and, uh, and I will pass it over to Sarah. <clears throat> Hi friends, my name is Sarah Porkolov. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a storyteller and arts activist. Uh, I'm Filipina, so my skin is the color of caramel, long black hair parted down the middle. I'm wearing a pair of gamer headphones, which makes me look like a nerdy pilot. And hopefully the sound quality on your end is good because that's really why I got these. In the background, you can see a shiny black toolbox and plants sitting on top of it and some exposed brick because your girl lives in Pioneer Square. I'm so excited to be here. I'm gonna pass it off to Naho. Thank you, Sarah. My name is Naho and I use she, her pronouns and I am an actor an educator and I'm also a racial equity consultant. I um, I have long dark hair and I just got haircut so I have bangs <laughs> for the first time after when the, we went into quarantine. My background is actually a virtual background that sort of echoes what Sarah said with brick walls with large window behind me that overlooks sort of a city building that has sort of a clean office look that made me feel good. I'm going to pass to, I guess, Christiana. Hello, my name is Christiana. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I do a lot of things. I don't even know, I don't know what capacity I'm here in today. Um, I'm, a, I'm a social- All of them? <laughs> I'm a social equity consultant uh, for Epiphanies of Equity LLC, of which uh, part of that is um, artistic justice and um, how to make the arts more uh, equitable and accessible, um, as well as the intersection to disability justice, racial justice, economic justice, gender justice, and um, size acceptance as well uh, is a lot of my favorite things. I'm also a artist, um, I'm a writer, I'm an actress, I sing, I do all the things. Um, and a lot of that, uh, my understanding of equity and getting to this space came from that background. I was trying to think of what I can call myself, because I was going to say Carmel too, perhaps like a deeper, I, I am also Carmel, but I am perhaps like a Werther's original <laughs> level Carmel. Um, I am wearing a navy shirt that says living the dream. I'm also wearing an amethyst necklace. I have red lips. I have uh, secretary glasses and I am wearing a multicolored head wrap. I am sitting in a leather high back chair in a room full of books and I, and I don't put that lightly. Um, additionally, on one side of the room, there is a, a, sil a silver and purple curtain 
There is also a pumpkin and various knickknacks around. And if, if you are lucky, there is a tiny puppy in a red and white shirt that may be in this dog bed over here. Thank you for that. I look forward to the puppy appearance at some point in our conversation. Um, well, friends, uh, I do want us to get started with one of these questions that Number has brought to our attention. Um, and let's start big. Let's start with the magic wand question. If you could recreate the theater landscape right now, based on your knowledge and lived experience and what you want to see in the world, what would you want it to look like? What would you do differently? Is someone inspired to begin the discussion? I'll start. No one Thank else you, will. Kathy. <laughs> um, for me, in really thinking about that question, um, I would love theater to be so fully supported uh, at a federal, national, local level um, that anyone could attend um, in any way that they want to engage um, so that theater becomes the center of civic life where stories, all of our stories, are shared um, where, you know, in that imaginary future and hopefully uh, won't be imaginary forever, um, um, would be one where the, the minute you, uh, that the grounds that it would be centered to every city, um, a town, a neighborhood, um, and that the grounds are such that it's basically set in a park and people could come and spend the day there. Um, and uh, with their families of all ages, there'd be programming for, um, different people with different interests and we all have different unique, you know, things that we enjoy and that artists would be fully supported to be able to um, create and let their imaginations go, that the housing for them would actually be on site, um, that transportation to the events would be um, open and accessible for all, um, and that a, a, a diversity of stories um, would be available and that it doesn't all happen necessarily in person either that we have in person, but we also have these different ways of engaging, depending on what people feel like that day um, that we that that it could be uh, through radio formats, it could be through online formats, it could be in person formats. And in addition to uh, just presentations of stories, um, not just kind of the formal ones where you go and you see this fancy set but there would be rooms where people could share personal stories of, of because I actually really go back to the indigenous, um, what I imagine how theater began was uh, around a campfire where an entire village would spend their evening sharing stories with each other. Um, and that it, it, it was really the way that people connected holistically, humanistically, and that everyone was able to live up to their fullest potential and their authentic self in sharing their gifts with each other. Oh my goodness, that is so beautiful. I want to go to there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Manny, do you have some thoughts on what you think theater would look like in like Manny's interpretation of a theater sure. landscape? Well, you know, all I could think of when 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 Kathy was uh, telling her story and vision is that it's so complete, right? Um, so I think what I would would add to it, or maybe try to see a different lens, because because that was such a really great role that theater was in every place, right? Because right now, to contrast and to to highlight why that's a really a, a vision that we need to work to is that right now theaters are where they can afford to be, right? Or where there's um, a great interest in it, which only plays to the people that see the value. But but what Kathy's vision is about access, right? And introduce and 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 through access, everyone is introduced to the power of theater, right? Um, I also uh, maybe a different view of looking at that really complete vision is is how people look to theater, right? That people are looking for it in their main street neighborhood hubs in the center of town, um, and that um, and. And that also carries all across Washington state, right? I mean, it may be a little hard for us to imagine those of us that live here in King County or in, in very specifically those of us who live in Seattle, uh, that you know there isn't too far we have to travel for a theater, but imagine when your town doesn't have a theater, 
right? And you don't get that opportunity for reflection. We don't get that opportunity to visit a place that humanizes the concepts and the ideas and personalizes it in a way uh, that the magical way that theater does. So, um, so theater within all of our 280 cities, towns and hamlets all across Washington state. Um, and also to know that, that by that even having that isn't something special about Washington, that it's, it is what is unique about America, right? Um, uh, and, and then therefore that the, the flavor of theater that happens in each uh, um, city, town or hamlet is really specific to that community. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm hearing I just wanna, little... oh, Go ahead, Mickey. Sorry, um, I just want to add on, I guess. Um, Kathy, I think you had like a really thorough and really cool explanation of what you think theater should um, should look like. And and I, what I think personally, I have a much more, um, I, I have a different slant at it. Um, I came in with this thinking, I think theater should should really transform into something into classrooms. Um, as a student myself, um, class, I, I, I love school and classrooms are, I think, one of the most important places for expression, um, storytelling and learning, which I think is fundamentally what theater really is about, right? And, and theater doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, that traditional setting of a stage, but it can be in classrooms. Um, it can be in the places that we already occupy. Um, and I think one of the important things about bringing theater into classrooms is that the value of learning isn't, you know, it's not always about, you know, memorizing, reading the textbook, memorizing, et cetera. It's really, it really comes down to um, learning about stories and learning about experiences. And I think that's what's so important. And I think that's why there's such an important like intersectionality there. Um, and I think a great example about you know, the, the flexibility of what storytelling can be, for example, is um, I, I like to listen to podcasts, for example. Um, and uh, for one example, Glenn Washington's uh, Snap Judgment it's on NPR. I think it's pretty fun. Um, and some, something really interesting is that his podcast is, um, it takes a lot of theatrical elements. It uses music. It uses, you know, um, uh, all these different elements that you would, that you'd see in a theater um and it's kind of untraditional but it's interesting because it, it educates it it um teaches me about the world through a very anecdotal and a very personalized approach and i think fundamentally that's really important to theater and storytelling in general um you know also like hidden brain that's another um really cool podcast on NPR, I think. And it's really about human psychology. And it presents a lot of, uh, you know, statistics and research, but it does it through the lens of experiences. It brings in people, it brings in individuals, and it, and it tells these stories through people. So what I'm trying to get to, I guess, is that I think theater um, can be very flexible in what it can look like. It can be a regular spaces, it doesn't necessarily mean we build more theaters, it can really, it can fundamentally mean, um, you know, going into the classrooms, going into these public spaces, these places that we already have, because the flexibility and the fundamental idea of storytelling really is what theater is about. And I think um, that's the direction I'd like to see. It, and I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, I love what you just said, what Mickey just said. And you know, I'm also an educator and absolutely, yes. And I, theater, I think there's this notion that, you know, theater is supposed to be this way or that way. And I, you know, and I think that's where I want to see is like, really, who decided what it has to be? You know, this is storytelling. There's kids playing on the street and making up stories. And, you know, I made up stories with my sisters when I was growing up and, that's the storytelling, that's the art, that's the theater. And I think because of the way things are structured, I think sometimes we all get caught up in like, this is how it's supposed to be. And if there was a magic wand, like Kathy said, it should be everywhere. It shouldn't, there shouldn't, they shouldn't have to pay to go see things or 
just because you pay two hundred dollars to go see, you know, this show that everybody's talking about, does is it necessarily good? I don't know, you know. And the project that the students create at schools, those things are amazing, and it just is exactly what it's supposed to be. So I absolutely loved what you said, Nikki, and yeah. I think that's the magic of theater. It doesn't have to be this way or that, you know? And yes, and Manny said, access, everybody has access to create and the right to create and to be part of it. And jumping on on, on your concept, your, uh, your words of the magic of theater, right? When we think about the potential of theater, like stories, you're right, it's all about stories. Um, I read, 30 stories today on the news. Um, I got on the phone and I talked about a variety of different stories. I heard stories, but the potential of theater is when you take a story and you have an intention around it, right? And so therefore, really um, the curation of story, the the community gathering community around a story to to take us to some place, to a level of thinking. Maybe not to maybe not to direct the outcome of our thinking, but to open our minds for us to 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 think about it and to have our own uh, you know the uh, outcome or or for us to discover how it resonates on us. And and I think that's where you know when we start talking about. Um, art at, and theater at the heart of civic life is the fact that, you know, a lot of um, civics is really organized, organized around addressing problems or having a vision or, you know, a, a, a evolving community. Well, and that's where the power and the potential of theater is, is like, let's do that with intention, right? I'm telling you, I, I encountered a lot of stories today. Most of it will not stick with me for the rest of the day, right? Some of the news stories definitely will, <laughs> but but you know, but the random stories that I encountered today, I'm, it, it was just it was in the moment. It was just random. It kind of crossed my path, but it's it's the intentional story that really takes me someplace that 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 I grew from, that opened my eyes to something, that built a bridge to me, to an idea, to a person. Uh, that made that opened up my heart to have more level of compassion about something that I, that that I had a blockade over, you know that that's where where theater can have uh, have massive always holds massive potential, <clears throat> and that's the creativity and the art of the artist, right? It's the artist who who crafts that in a way that it sticks with people um, as a lifelong experience. Mm -hmm. Yes to everything everybody said. And very explicitly, I'd like to see an American theater that's divested from the white supremacist transactional culture that it's currently embedded in. One that prioritizes access for all people, especially for black, indigenous, POC folks, non-binary, trans folks. To also see an American theater that is not primarily in English, would be dope. <laughs> like, why isn't it mandatory for our, our regional theaters to be at least bilingual? Not even, I mean, like, we need to have closed captions. <laughs> we got to have ASL interpreters, right? Um, I also think that having an American theater that's divested from capitalism would be pretty dope, too. We have these main stage seasons, which are the cornerstone in terms of these uh, institutional programming. And we have educational departments getting all this grant money, largely being uh, bodied by Black, Indigenous, POC folks in the educational department who are reaching like the youth demographic that theater needs to be accessible to. And often those employees are underworked and underpaid. I also would love to see an American theater that's really invested in new work and local artists, an American theater that is divested from an East Coast, New York, Broadway, great white way uh, pedestal. That'd be pretty great. Um, would also like to see an American theater that puts accessibility at the forefront when we also think about space as a commodity. 
what it means for our theaters right now to be empty because of COVID, but even pre-COVID, they were largely empty most of the time, right? Besides like Thursday through Sundays when the audience was there. What happens when we make a creative theatrical space a community space first? Oh my goodness, thank you for speaking my language. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I wanna, um, I guess, inject, I, I think um, all those things you said were really amazing. And I, you mentioned something about, you know, um, catering to the youth and um, being a student, I, I do wanna add on, I think it's really an important and great point about the, the whole concept of engaging young people, whether it be in civics or theater. Um, I, I'm a volunteer for the Washington bus. I should have said so earlier. Um, but a lot of the work that the Washington bus does um, is um, engaging young people in politics and civics um, across Washington state. And, and the reason why there's such a huge emphasis on young people is because young people, students, myself included, were very impressionable. Um, the things that happen during our adolescence we're going to carry throughout our entire lives. And, um, you know, when we talk about politics and policymaking, it's, it's so easy to ignore young people just because, you know, we can't vote or whatnot. But I think there has to be like this focus on young people because the impact that you have on students now, um, it's going to shape the, um, the culture uh, around civics and theater for the next 50 years. Um, and I think that's an important intersection to realize between, I guess, both of these spheres, civics and theater, because um, to engage the youth is to really shape the next generation of, of our citizens. Um, so that's, that's also why I, I just think um, classrooms are such an important space for that, because it's not just about young people, it's about this, this upcoming generation. Um, yeah. Thank you, Miki. Yeah, in a lot of ways, what I'm hearing you say, and you speak so much truth, uh, whatever you are the change we're gonna see, you all are the folks who are gonna implement whatever those of us who are currently in a position to invite change or demand it. Um, uh, whatever we talk about, you all are gonna make happen in a lot of ways. So thank you for that. Thank you for that um, call out. Christiana, we haven't heard from you yet. What are your thoughts on what you would like the theater landscape to look like? Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm realizing I had to be a little bit like faster with this <laughs> and, and getting in. Um, I wanted to, I, yes to everything that's been said. What I wanted to share was when I think about like civic theater and where, where, where this could go, I, I think about my my personal heritage and indigeneity and like what that means in terms of re like de like decolonizing how we see theater like theater doesn't necessarily have to be something for consumption and it also doesn't necessarily have to be something in a certain space it doesn't even have to necessarily be something that's constructed to me in a certain framework or even storytelling and how we see it and we it can just uh, it can perhaps be a a, a form of communication that we infuse into our, our work as people are saying like uh, you know in certain spaces like like the like the classroom but I'm even thinking like in in political space in you know if if, if it, there are certain aspects where you know if you're to go to give public comment and you are trying to explain for example hey you know we continue to have an eviction moratorium for a year, how are we gonna pay our rent without rent forgiveness? And you can have it your two, three minute public comment for that. But even, even as much as having finger puppets, I lost my job in March. We still have to pay the rent. Even if we start doing that is going to, to not only elicit a different sort of story, but also it's going to hit a different part. So as I've been doing some of my heritage um, like research, like in the, one of the uh, indigenous uh, identities that I hold is that I'm Igbo, which is um, from Nigeria. And so I was looking through some of the old pictures of the Igbo and it was some a hundred years ago where they would have these, these times where people would come and they would create these grand masks and they would go to the, to, 
to the, the to the community and they would have these these um these presentations theater but it was communicating messaging so even to 100 years ago seeing a mask of a person where it is this four foot depiction of um, an art, uh, an anthropologist with with the pith helmet and and the the jacket and the and the writing pad. I could tell what that story was about. Um, and even today, I think about what it, you know. I'm originally from Philadelphia as a black person, but this is the seventh state I've lived in. Mm. And so I think about even in my culture, there's theater when they come in like. Let me tell you what happened because this person said whoop, 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 and then this happened. And you're telling a story in a way that is still theater and you're providing um, messaging because in that is either a call to action and ask for help. And what do you think for advice? And then you can respond back like, yeah, that reminds me of this time I had this. And you go through your, your storytelling. What would it mean for this to be part of performance reviews for employees? What would this mean for this to be part of our trainings in terms of, of you know, psychodrama in, in processing how we speak with each other in the world. What would this mean to have this be part of the way that people can provide a public comment as a community? What would this mean in terms of folks, you know, who say have barriers to articulation, whether it's because of being neurodivergent or whatever have you, can still lead this conversation forward um, through theater. And so what does that look like in the radical imaginary of what is possible um, to have theater go back to a form of communication? And, and I think the last thing I'll say too is one of the things that I, of, of why I'm in the field that I am is I'm obsessed with humans. I'm obsessed with why humans human and why humans human with other humans humaning together. And so uh, one of those things I think is so interesting about humans humaning together is that this sort of spoken language aspect is relatively new in terms of humans being in society with each other. Before we had other forms of communication and theater and acting out and depiction was one of them. So what would it look like in our decolonization work, especially, you know, not, not just from the enlightenment period, which is my least favorite period, but in, just in decolonization throughout, would it look like to go back to our roots in those different sort of ways? I want to add on a little bit about um, Christiane. You said theater as a form of communication, and that, that just sparked something in me. I think that was so cool because, um, you know, when you when you think about policymaking, um, you know, in, in, in government, um, a lot of it is so much about communication, right? It's, it's how do you communicate the ideas and the needs of citizens to make sure uh, politicians carry that out. And that's a very hard thing to do, I think. Um, oftentimes, policymaking is done through such a, um, through numbers, in a sense. Um, you know, like, look at, let's look at the numbers, the percentages, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I think it oftentimes overlooks the fact that, you know, government and policy is all about the people. Um, and, and I think theater can really be a form of communication to really speak to maybe these politicians or community leaders. And what I mean by that is, I think theater, um, you know, Christian, I think you had a really cool point. Um, I think theater brings empathy to communication. Um, numbers don't, but stories do. So I, I think theater can be a really important tool in, um, in allowing, um, you know, public policymakers and community leaders to understand the feelings um, and the experiences of people in the community, because that's ultimately what government should be about, um, to listen and to react to the voices in, in, this, in our state. Um, so I think to inject theater as a form of, as a tool into, uh, in, in the policymaking process and in the process of government is going to be uh, really uh yeah changing i think really really important yeah i love what both of you have shared there um a lot of people don't know this but my first job with the city uh was actually a long time ago uh for the seattle police department believe it or not uh, for the domestic violence unit 
um, and it, we were a group of theater artists and we were actually working with um, the domestic violence unit to actually try to create a more a greater awareness of police officers and the public defenders around what is actually happening in that situation because lots of times people would get called into a scene and um, uh, abusers who do tend to be more predominantly male um, uh, they they are very charming and they would charm the police officers and of course uh, oftentimes the the person who has been affected and impacted by the violence um, is might be uh, uh, have like physically hurt, emotionally hurt, going through a lot of emotion. And so police officers who are predominantly male as well um, would only see one side of the situation. So we actually use theater as a way to really show all the psyche and um, what goes on internally and what the pre leading to when they show up came. And then we also did it for all the public defenders in terms of how people oftentimes just stereotype um, and prejudge the situation, which led to um, uh, really huge inequities and disparities, especially in communities of color when it comes to domestic violence. Um, so theater was a way that we used to change things. And actually from that experience, when I started working for the Office of Arts and Culture, um, we actually were trying to figure out ways that we could change policies around racial equity and instill more anti-racism across all the different sectors that we work with. And um, starting with internally with city employees and hiring practices um, and the microaggressions and direct racism that a lot of um, uh, uh, people of the global majority working for the city were experiencing. Um, and so we actually hired Sarah <laughs> uh, to come in and help us. We collected stories from city employees who had been experiencing trauma in the workplace um, and, uh, and brought in Sarah to actually curate these stories. So it was the words of actual employees and, and to actually create trainings from that. And then we built on that over several years to actually just do, use it as a basis and foundation for a whole curriculum for city employees to, because then if city employees are really addressing institutionalized racism, then the policies and practices that we then carry out with community can expand that as well. Um, so those are some of the places where we're already starting to do that work um, with artists in partnership. You know, when I think about theater, I think um, of the, the storytelling and the event itself, but then I also think about the, the um, creative process and the role of creative process in civic practice. And um, Kathy, I've, I've known a number of folks who've done similar work to what you're describing with the police department in the medical field, yeah. assisting doctors with trying to better understand how their patients might be responding. Um, but I'm also curious about all of your thoughts around the role of artists and particularly those with experience in theatrical settings um, in civic practice, in community organizing, in um, the way in which our businesses function and our communities uh, grow, what's what's the what's the role that theater can play in our greater um, I think community? Huge! At an equity summit about six years ago, I actually presented, um, and this is a national equity summit on the fact that we actually need artists in every city department, um, in every um, uh, working in transportation office. That's actually something that our office is doing. Um, but we actually were trying to convince like across our country, the federal government um, in every single kind of sector, climate change, food justice, wherever, we need more artists because artists like scientists start off oftentimes with the question of trying to explore some concept and use artistic practice to open up that exploration, inviting an audience to participate in that exploration together. So most great art doesn't actually give answers. It actually opens up questions and minds so that we can all explore it collectively in community. And I think too, with what's going on in the world, art is essential and I think we have to look at artists as essential workers for healing toward and you know changing the system that's going on and I love this uh, quote from Toni Morrison this is precisely the time when artists go to work 
There's no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. And I think that's one of my favorite quotes. And especially when the times are tough and because of the pandemic, you know, double pandemic of health, uh, public health crisis and racial inequity and injustice. This is really the time I think we <clears throat> need to do stuff and we can do things to communicate, to tell stories and to, you know, appeal to people about the stories of who we are. And as, you know, Kathy said, we need to see more global majority represented in those storytelling. And, you know, as Sarah said, this is being sort of created as in the white dominant culture. This is what theater should be. But really, mm -hmm. this is really the time to say, you know what, this is also our work as artists is essential workers to heal and to transform what's going on in response to all the things that's happening. And in so many parts, so many parts of the world, theater and storytelling is a community activity, right? It's not for a certain subsect of the community. It is for all of the community. And I'm, and it's done by not folks who are exclusively committed to this work, but are involved in various aspects of the community and the society. So I love this idea of, um, utilizing these theatrical techniques or this creative process that we're also committed to, um, to improve our, to improve our world, to make, to, to ask those big questions and not just in a presentational way, but in a participatory way, like we're all involved in this. I think about Teatro Camposino and I think about the ways in which theater has been used for community organizing in this country. Um, and I'm interested to hear more from all of you about what we can do um, right now with the big questions that we are all facing. You know, th this connects to a conversation I had today about what artists can be doing right now. Um, and I give full credit to my partner, uh, Julie Baker, who heads the Arts Advocacy and Cultural Advocacy Organization in California. Um, she intercept, uh, it introduced uh, the, uh, the the concept of artists as second responders uh, uh, in the very beginning of the pandemic, right? And now she said she had a fever dream and she woke up and she was like, oh my gosh, it could be a piece of legislation. So she's created a piece of legislation called artists as second responders. And the concept of it is that embedding artists as, as a way of responding to the pandemic. So therefore, and, and, and she's still trying to figure out how this works, but I want to give her total credit for this. I didn't know, this is not my idea, but I will, I will likely copy it once she gets it really going, <laughs> is, is, for example, when there's a hurricane, when there's a catastrophe, that part of FEMA funding can, is dedicated, right, to creative practice within responding to it, right? Um, however, and of course, letting the community decide what that creative practice will be to respond to it. And, um, but it really recognizes that in that moment when there's trauma, when, when, uh, when there's confusion, uh, that, that theater can inspire hope and direction and can also, and also capture the stories of what's happening right there, um, uh, because this is also, we're making history. Um, so I think you're right. We need to embed artists in, in, in in all of these things and in, in every movement and every civic practice. Um, I often kind of like, I, you know, one thing that I re recently have a volunteer look uh, doing right now is, is we, we have to step up and also push ourselves into these rooms, right? And we also have to, as theater artists, make sure that when we are, when we are stepping into these rooms that we are stepping in um, really reflective of the diverse community that we are, right? And so therefore, um, you know, all, public commissions, you know, the city has a bunch of them, the county has a bunch of them, the state has a bunch of them. We need to be on every one and not the ones that we always think, well, that's the one that makes most sense. No, every single one, the utility district, right? Like that theater and creativity and, and cultural programming, a person who understands that is always there to 
because one, we're people, we have thoughts about all of these things, but also we can be the, the one to interject and say, you know, this is how, you know, creativity can address that or theater can address that. You know, that's, we have to be more engaged, you know? <clears throat> Yeah, I would, say, I would say that what is, um, what's exciting for me in this time is when people ask that question, which I get asked this question a lot as a consultant, well, what am I supposed to do? What, what do I do next? And what I always tell folks is that our impact fractals out and there's, there's a part of our body that thinks, and there's a part of our body that thinks about what we think. And the part of our body that thinks is the part of our body that drives the primary part of our action. And so in doing the, the work that we need to in getting in touch with who we are intrapersonally, I think as theater artists in particular, but artists nonetheless, we have more tools that are equipped, as I heard some examples here, of being able to do that intrapersonal work. I, I have both monologues and entire theaters in my head. Um, I, I also feel that in my experience of identifying as a person with psych a psychiatric disability or identifying as a mad person, um, that there's also an opportunity to hone in those experiences that I have into an artistic creative process to grapple not only with what that means for me, but also what are they saying? And I think it brings in a, my indigenous spirituality of, of speaking to my ancestors or speak, is speaking to the universe of having those sort of internal pieces. And it also creates a framework and a template for how I continue to do this work. So I think that as we are moving forward and thinking of how we are going to change the systems, we also have to think about the ways in which we're having those uh, check-ins with ourselves, whether it's monologues or whether it is talking to all aspects of our psyche and I think as we prepare to go into space, I think it will be also really important, like I said, to consider the ways in which we see this journey as a relay, perhaps a marathon, definitely not a sprint, but perhaps more like a relay, that we're doing the both and. I mean, for example, we talk about the civil rights movement as if it's uh, his, all the way back in history, but it was only 57 years ago. And I, 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 I would be surprised if there wasn't someone either listening or on this panel that's at least 57, which means you're as, as old as our country desegregating itself. And if you get to the ADA, that's only 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, so this is within living memory. We are, we are only just at the very, very beginning of a centuries long issue. I think that part of pro getting ready to pass on that baton is in standing on the shoulders of giants is also to start to hold what it looks like to really expand our artist community to folks who it's been historically um, uh, uh, and disproportionately banned, uh, banned from them. Uh, I, here in Seattle, there's the Onyx, well, there was the Onyx Gallery and, when, and I went there during the soft opening and one of the most, um, again, stories, the difficult sort of stories I heard is that they started the Onyx Gallery specifically for black visual artists. And as they were receiving uh, people who were sitting in their art, there were people who were like, oh yeah, well, I've had these canvases in my garage for 20, 30 years because I never thought I was ever gonna get a showing. Um, and, you know, it's, there's, uh, I forget who, I think it was Telehard de Chardin, I forget my, my Jesuits, but someone had said that the worst possible thing that can happen is for a person to die with their song still inside them. And so while we are preparing to pass that baton on to the next generation, we also have to hold what it looks like to amplify not just the voices and the art, art artistry, but the leadership and what that looks like in all various forms for the people who are here within living memory who, who have not been able to get a chance because they are here. And, while there are some issues that we have that are a hundred plus years old or some issues that we have that um, people were grown adults. I mean, you know, we, we have a choice, for example, next week between a person who was 19 and 21 respectively when the Civil Rights Act was passed. Um, I don't know about you, but by the time I was 19, 21 years old, I was already socialized and conditioned to what I thought the world was supposed to be. So we have a lot of work to do and it's, and it's um, imminent, but it also is, is we should expect that it's gonna take um, longer than 60 years to, to, to address. So really moving into that radical imaginary of what it looks like 
um, to see theater, not just in its current form and how we can infuse it into our society, but also to see and consider what we could possibly imagine um, what was formerly considered theater, perhaps it's a different word in the future and how that uh, plays a part as a society. So much of what you all are saying is at leading me to think about how we define theater and what that really means. And I think it, that might be too big a question to answer in the next 10 minutes, but I pose it to you. Like, what is what is theater? And I think that's the, you know, question. And I think we all need to question, like, because we are all socialized to believe or, you know, to think of what theater is supposed to be. And, you know, we all went to some sort of educational or some kind of institution to learn how to do this, or this is how the blocking happens, and this is what the director does, and this is what the kids do, I mean, the actors do. And I was uh, doing a workshop with a group of teaching artists, and we were having conversation about, you know, liberating the space and allowing students to be able to explore and be an artist. And then there was a conversation like at the same time, you have to teach them, you know, what a blocking is and what, it, you know, what they're supposed to do when the director tells you to do something. And I said, or oh, do we, right? Do we, I mean, whose notion is that? Whose standard are we following? Most of these institutions and the way that we learn theater is supposed to be, as Sarah pointed out, is coming from a very white dominant institutional idea of what theater should be. And that's what we learned, that's what I learned. And that's what, you know, as an educator, I have to consciously undo what I learned or what I think should be the right way. And, you know, as a mother and going through these online learnings and ed education system, who said you are supposed to know these multi-digit multiplication and pass this test by the time you're in fourth grade? Who made that decision? People who's sitting in the room making those, you know, tests standard. But not everybody goes through that. Not everybody will make it. That's not how my child learns, you know? So I think changing, the challenging the idea of what theater is, I think is... This is, I think this is exciting, decolonizing the way we think of theater and what is that, you know, and undoing what I learned to be, to try and spread that unlearning process for all of us is important, I think. Um, I think um, you had a really interesting point about, um, you know, changing what education should look like. Um, and I personally think that the notion of you know, storytelling can uh, really be a powerful tool in re like rethinking what it means to teach in schools. Um, and I see this in my own life. You know, I, I take a government class at, at Newport, um, AP Gov, and um, you know, I love the class. It's really engaging. It's really fun. But there, but it's it's not the dates and it's not memorizing the textbook that's interesting. For example. When I learn about Marbury, Marbury versus Madison, right? I mean, you know, one of the most famous Supreme Court cases ever in the United States. It's, it's not the legal legalities and the technicals that, that pull me into it. It's the story behind it. I mean, there is an entire novel, novel's worth of story behind Marbury versus Madison. And to explore that in the classroom is what keeps me going back to learning about government. And so I, I think storytelling can, um, is really uh, underappreciated in the classrooms and, and to be able to, I think storytelling can be a vehicle through which we can um, kind of analyze and reimagine again um, what teaching should look like. And I think another really interesting point of what storytelling can do is I think it, it, can, it, it can evoke a lot of dialogue in the classroom. Um, one of the great things about, um, I think, you know, at theater, uh, Angie, I think you said something about how it's very engaging, how it's a, you know, a two-way street. It's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. Um, and I think classrooms are ought to be more like that. Um, 
when it's when it's a one way um, one way street, a teacher just talking, lecturing, like this didactic uh, like stream of information coming at you, it's it's boring. It's not fun, and I don't learn. So I think um, through storytelling, um, it really opens up this opportunity for students and teachers alike to really challenge ideas and to and to bring their own experiences into uh, the content of learning. Um, so yeah, I think it, it really can amplify um, the educational process. And I agree, I think we are, we are ought to kind of rethink what learning should look like because it, it's not always a textbook thing. It's not always a memorizing a days type of thing. I think bringing theater into the classrooms can fundamentally uh, overhaul and make it a much more um, engaging and equitable process for students to go through public education. I, I love what you just said, Mickey, because, okay, when I was little, my dream was actually to redesign the entire education system in the United States. <laughs> of of course it was, <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> of that and it was because i was actually very fortunate um in middle school um i was part of an experimental class where uh there was um uh, an educator who was trying to experiment with how you actually center um not the didactic like lecture and but it was actually we actually role played in every every single course subject so we we learned about um uh, uh ba basically we did role playing where we had to convince, you know, why should this um, uh, ele uh, electrical system, train system come through this town instead of that town. So we had to learn everything about that town and the geography and everything like that. And then we actually played roles and other people were the UN people who had to make the decision. Like, so everything we did, we learned. And I still remember everything I learned um, in that year of being in that experimental class. And I thought, this is how education should be. Um, but most, uh, then I spent seven years touring the whole country um, as an educator, theater artist, and realized most education systems are not that, and talking with the students. So I love, I, I love that. And I actually think the reason why when we started with the first question about the magic wand, and I framed it the way I did about what it can be, as opposed to what we're trying to move away from, is um, is because lots of times right now we're so stuck in a white supremacy culture that has set up systems and structures that are not healthy for 99% of us um, that uh, uh, it's hard for us to move away from that if we keep talking about what we don't want or how things are that we're trying to get away from because then that's always the elephant in the room. And so what I, I love how Mickey's thinking because I want us to talk about like, what do we want like just start from what do we want and create that so that we're no longer centering white supremacy culture and the things that don't work but we're actually centering the imaginations and creativity of our young people with great ideas um, and how to create what we actually want and the world that we want to exist in i i also wanted to say to you because that is exactly like what when i think about like what exactly is theater so like um as I shared, like I, I'm multiply disabled. One of the, the first disability, of course, I was born with an autistic. And perhaps that's this is part of it in that I don't know about y'all, but I very much feel like I'm performing all the time. It, it's the reason why I, I really center social construct as perhaps like a life philosophy. Social construction is essentially when a bunch of humans come together and say, this is what it is. And then we continue that way. Sometimes we're forced to continue in that way, or sometimes we're part of the decision-making of continuing that way. And so if you think about different sort of social constructs that we just sort of take for granted in our super conscious, where we become desensitized to it, like professionalism, which leads to like conversation around manners, beauty, altruism. What, 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 what exactly is that? Like, so at the end of the day, we are performing these, these expectations that we've been conditioned and socialized into for folks who come from different backgrounds or different nationalities or cultures, it also perhaps can feel the, ex the extent to which we have to, the visual extent to which we have to perform. And perhaps we take it for granted because we've also sort of been conditioned to a construct that that's, well, that's just the way things are. There's just the way that you're supposed to be in this space and there's a way you're supposed to be in that space. 
But we are getting into a space in the 21st century where we're starting to look at how to deconstruct that. We talk about this in terms of the gender binary. We talk about this in terms of things like currency and money and anti-capitalism. We talk about this in a lot of sort of different ways. And so I think with theater, one of the first things you need to do is really think about the constructs of it. Um, the constructs not only is creating the building blocks of it and the histories of it, but the constructs that are surrounding it, like white supremacy culture. Whiteness is such a fluid identity that when I was growing up on the East Coast, there's a lot of people who are second and uh, third generation Americans who talked about when their parents came over or their grandparents came over, they weren't considered white. Whiteness was a very specific thing that if you didn't match it naturally, you had to go to court and argue and win your court case to actually be considered white. It's a construct. So there's a lot of this that I really truly think perhaps not optimistically, but hopefully, that if we can construct an inequitable society, that, then we can reconstruct an equitable one. And I think part of that is getting to that place, like in the matrix where we take the red pill and we actually see it for the building blocks or the atomizing of inequity in our society that it is. That everything, perhaps, you know, another way of calling myself as an absurdist, but everything is absurd. And there's mm -hmm. so much of this that we have as part of the human experience of trying to, um, understand life but in so many ways how is that not theater i want to say some I, I your idea of construct is is so cool to me because um actually in my english class right now i'm learning about critical theory um, um so you know i i've I've read stuff about feminist theory um marxist theory um critical race theory and and you can you can look at pieces of literature you can look at pieces of art through lenses, like putting on the new pair of glasses and you look at something and, and just this whole realm of I, these different facets of ideas just totally jump out. So, you know, you read, you read something and you don't realize it. And then you put on this pair, like, let's think of it through the eyes of critical feminist theory. And then suddenly these social inequities, the patriarchy and all these things start to jump out on the paper. Mm. And I think if we, and that's something that is really um, eye-opening, literally, um, because you can put on these new pairs of glasses and you go, whoa, whoa, I did not think of my life like this. I, you know, I learned it. I, when I first, my teacher introduced Marxist theory and I was like, Marxist theory? Uh, we're in a, you know, it's, it's kind of, I've never thought about, think, you know, looking at things through a Marxist lens, you know, through a, through a critical lens of economics. Um, and you start to look at literature and then you, and then you start to look at your own life. Like, why did I just make that decision? Why did I go do that in my life? And you go, oh, and you, you, you walk back the steps and you realize that you really are, I am living through these preconceived lenses of what society should be. And so I think if we can look at theater in that same way through these different lenses, um, I think it can really reveal what theater can be in the future. So I think Christiana had a really uh, like amazing point about um, like how to look at things, I guess. Thank it is you. really hard to be on this panel because uh, as a panelist, I'm just so caught up in just listening to all of you with your smart ideas and inspiring ideas. It's <laughs> like, that's right. I was supposed to say something, uh, but uh, Oh my God, that's really um, all of that. Um, I mean, it's it's exciting too that even something as as old and ancient as theater still has so many places to go, right? I mean, and that's and that should really that that's what's so exciting, right? Is that we can still reinvent it and and make it more relevant. Um, you know, um, some of the things I wrote down about that question about what is theater is, uh, you know, st uh, theater is story. Theater shares human experience. Theater is collaborative and, sh and 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 participatory. I know that sometimes we get some rap like, "Where you sit and you watch?" No, I don't. I gasp. I feel. I answer questions. I agree. I disagree. I mean, all of those things. And then I'm gonna. And then I have to process it and think about it. And I spread that. And. Um, and it also, um, and in the role of theater is that it, it, it you know, it, it inspires people and it spotlights situations and it humanizes something 
it humanizes it, right? Like, you, you know, Mickey, when you're talking about, you know, sitting in class and you hear this information and it's, and, you, and it's set up to just be like, I tell you something, you memorize it, right? Or you understand it, right? Well, um, but, but when we lean in, you know, you know, Kathy's idea of reinventing the education system is to make it relevant to you, to, ma to make sure, to provide in education way that you care, right? Um, it promotes curiosity and it's, and it's particip and it's and again it's participatory and 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 those are all and what's great about all of those things is it does it doesn't necessarily put it in a box. Sure, we're all theater artists and we're gonna you know sometimes I direct a show and I love to use a lot of silk, right? We're all gonna have our specific way of putting on that show, but but it does all of that and and we as artists get to put our own imprint by doing it a certain way, and. One thing that I didn't want to let go because it, it, it's just really sad on me ever since we talked about it earlier is we we're talking about measuring things. And, and you're right. We just, we, uh, we want to understand impact. And the only way we understand that is by numbers, apparently, right? Because we, we be, you know, number of people that saw the show, number of this or this or that. But, but I, and, and, but theater can be really measured. How do we measure the impact of a theater experience, right? And uh, and when we were talking about that earlier, these are the things that came to mind. Uh, is 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 um, that that when I think about a moment where somebody had to push against, um, when somebody had to express their 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 passion and their thoughts, I remember theater moments, right? Like I think about Kathy and in Letters to Student Revolution, I stand in that stage with that with that red cloth, and you know, and 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 I'm telling you, Sarah, I've been in a number of family parties where where I see the the uh, generations of women in that room, you know, and I think about your beautiful work. I mean, like I I think of theater experience. How do we measure what? how do we measure a story on stage, how that makes an impact, not based off of the number of people that, that saw the show, but the way that it actually inspires someone's life. That's the thing that we can't really capture, but maybe we should. Maybe all of our theaters should ask those questions about like, what did you see? We're gonna take you back five seasons ago. What show did you see? And, and, and is there a way you can tell us a story about how that show made an impact recently? You know, what, 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 did you reflect on that? Did it change something in your life? Did it inspire you to get over a fear? Something. How do we measure that ex, that that theater experience? I think that's how we really start to to to. Sh that's how we should really measure how we uh, how we make that human impact. <clears throat> I love that, Manny. One of the things I was just joking about this with someone the other day. Um, CIS Productions, um, we started with creating this episodic show about Asian American women and relationships. It was a romantic comedy. This was 20 years ago before Crazy Rich Asians. Um, and, and we actually measured our success by how many people came to our show and, uh, and actually ended up um, uh, breaking, like not being afraid to tell the person that they liked, that they liked them, and oh, then being able to connect oh. with each other from that, like that was one of our measurements. The other measurement, we had designed it for Asian Americans, but we actually saw dramatic numbers of immigrant um, Asians and immigrant um, South Americans and um, um, even East Europe, um, East African Americans coming to the show. And we asked them like, what is it about the show that you appreciate? And it's because they were trying to learn English, but the English that they learn in English classes was very formal, professional, English and it didn't allow them to actually have real relationships with people. So they wanted to actually hear how people really talk and engage in relationships with each other. So they were coming to our show to practice their English and be able to learn colloquial terms of how people actually interact with people of different races. And so, so I mean, that's where like theater, it's so many different kinds of theater, right? People engage with it because there's different things that create awareness for them. And the measures are not about like, did this make you understand world history, you know, whatever that is, um, um, uh, in those very specific rigid ways that I think so many people think about. And I think that's the whole, you know, notion of like, this is still within the institution because the funders are asking for numbers, you know, this is what we're gonna put on our annual report. Those are still measured in the very white dominant 
places, you know, this is how you get the funding. You pack the house, you didn't pack the house, we sold this much ticket. And I think that's where, you know, the magic wand question, like if we didn't have to do all of these things that we have to report to, you know, going back to education, um, do we need to know the multiplication table? Does it mean something, you know, or did the student learn about history through these kind of interactive, you know, playing, right? And it's still, and I think that's where we have to start to dismantle and question and tackle how we measure the impact of our art and then for it to be a norm, different norm for measuring impact of art. It's not just numbers that the funders are going to see, see, right? It's the people, it's the relationship and yeah. I think I think that's a really interesting idea that you know um, the the concept of measuring like how do you measure things and it, I think it's important to again like like be a little introspective about our society that even even the fundamental concept of one plus one equals two is nothing more than an ideology right it's a way we perceive the world around us it's not it's only true because we say so so the even something that seems so blatantly true, like one plus one equals two, I think it's still important for us to, to really think about like how, how, do, how does that affect the way we think, right? How does the fact that we value these numbers or how many people showed up to this show, like raw numbers like that, like how does that affect the society around us and how can we measure the success of theater and civic engagement in new ways? And I think we are ought to move, maybe perhaps move away from these, these, uh, this number oriented form of measurement because, you know, just, you know, uh, again, like numbers are no, nothing more than ideology. Um, and I think measuring success in new and different ways can really open, open our eyes to a whole different, um, like, tones of uh, tones of like how we can interpret interpret success um and it i i had this i, I had this sticky note um that i wrote this idea on before i walk, came here um and i really want to um just say that i really like the question about the magic wand because this is something that i i it's 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 a statement that i carry with me whenever I have any conversation about progress. Um, and, it's, and it's to dream with idealism and to move with pragmatism. Um, and that I think it's important to really have big dreams, have a vision, but it's, and it's also important to, to really understand what steps it's going to take to get there. And, and, and you know, I think that balance is gonna be really important in how we can imagine where theater can take society. Yeah. Thank Love you. That. Miki, thank you. I think that's a perfect thing to transition us to sharing, to inviting the audience to join the conversation and gaining just some more thoughts on this. Um, what I'm also hearing is um, to connect this idea of measurement to our earlier conversations that when theater becomes uh, more integrally a part of public life, um, we won't need we won't need these measures because the the what Manny was sharing about its impact on our lives is going to to be clear in all parts of civic life. Um, so we're transitioning to a community conversation portion of the event. Um, Right now, our, our Zoom audience is joining our conversation. And don't worry, you're muted and your cameras are off. So you don't have to join the conversation if you don't want to. You won't be live streamed unless you choose to. Um, but we are inviting you so that we can, can ask these questions to you. You are the civic life, uh, the public life that we are hoping to, um, to invite into uh, what theater is and vice versa. So we would love to um, kind of throw these questions back at you. Um, 
I would love to ask the audience if anyone would be willing to share and, and you can share and you can also ask questions if you would like. Um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts of what the role of an artist should be in the community that you want to live in. Um, the role of theater, as we've been talking about as this idea, but I'm also thinking about, about the role of the artist. Um, right now, we, we are at a disconnect from artists and we've talked a little bit about um, how arts and artists can, are already infused into our civic life and public life. Um, so I'd love to throw that question to the audience. How do you want theater art and artists to be a part of your community um, in your vision of the ideal community. Uh, and you can either unmute yourself or put in the chat that you wanna talk or just jump on. Um, you can turn on your camera if you'd like. I'd also love to, uh, as uh, the audience is thinking about their responses to that, I'd love to invite the um, panelists who have been chatting and sharing so much of their uh, information. If you'd like to take a break, you can feel free to turn off your camera. Um, if you want to become more of listeners and foreground that community voice, or just, you know, go get some water and take a little bit of a break, feel free to do that. If, so I'd like to invite that if that's of interest to the panelists. Um, yeah, so anybody who is now in the Zoom room, do you have thoughts that you'd like to contribute kind of burning ideas? Um, we would love, love, love to hear from you. Hi. Oh, can I start my video? Oh, you can. Yeah. Hi, AC Peterson. Pronouns Hi. are she and her. Hi, everyone. Um, just so many thoughts came into my mind. I appreciate everyone's really thoughtful comments. Thank you. Um, and as someone who has found my way into theater through choreography, it's one of those things I've always been aware of these sort of, I want to say artificial uh, boundaries that have just that exist in Western text-based theater. Um, I remember one time somebody on the panel invited me to do movement for a play that wasn't even a musical. And I was like, wow, how cool. Um, thank you, Manny. Um, and the other thing that just um, com coming at it from a choreographer point of view, um, at the very beginning, um, I've just, I've always been aware of spaces, rehearsal spaces, performance spaces, and there's space there that sits empty all the time. You go through a park and there's a piano and there's a sign that says, do not play the piano. And you go to a mall and there's a stage and they say, do not use the stage. And you're like, and they'll say, oh, it's insurance. But it's like, how can we, you know, how can we let little kids starting very young just start expressing themselves? Anyway, and then the other thing was, <coughs> um, you know, how about evenings that are more like open mic or um, it's theater, it's dance, it's music, it's it's whatever, and it just goes on and on. And whoever's whoever performs that week invites two or three people for the next week. Like, who says that the people who are the artistic directors are choosing these people? Thank you. Thank you so much for doing for sharing that, AC. You're absolutely right about this that I, that's a perfect image of that stage that says do not go on stage or the piano that says do not play of these con societal constructs that we've created to separate theater from public life. Um, and yeah, why can't theater happen on that stage? Why can't performance happen on that piano? And why can't performance happen outside of that stage as well that can also be considered theater? Um, yeah, just this idea of redefining what theater is, is so powerful in and of itself. Yeah, turn that piano into a drum. <laughs> Bam, that's what we're do, doing today. Do your performance in front of that stage. I love that, thank you, AC, that's really beautiful. And it so reminds me of the magic wand vision that Kathy started us out with. This like open-ended, anything is possible, anywhere is possible for us to work collaboratively around telling a story or examining a question. And actually, I just want to share the, the, that, that 
that image was actually inspired by, I'd spent some time in this small town in South America and on Saturday afternoon by their market, they just had this open stage in this open central area and everyone with their families of all ages came and people would, some people would be reciting poetry, some would be um, doing speeches, other people would be playing music, people were conversing. It was beautiful and that, that, that is what I still hold as a, a vision of what can be possible. Other thoughts from folks? I'll also um, offer, uh, ask the question this uh, brought to mind, um, where have you seen, audience, where have you seen theater at the heart of public life? Or theater integral, integrated into civic practice or vice versa? Um, my name is Haisem. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Um, and to me, uh, theater is really at its essence, uh, a relationship and a conversation. And those two things are actually what moves people to change. And so what I have always seen as the value of theater is that artists have a skill set to impact and influence people in a meaningful way that causes significant transformational, transformational change in people who otherwise would be close to the idea or concept. And that's what I think we offer uniquely, especially in this era of extreme bipartisanship, is a way of connecting across those who are different from us based upon values that we can both agree upon to really make change happen for those people who are disenfranchised and less fortunate. And what I'm really hoping that the artistic and theater community does now in the midst of the COVID pandemic is to come up with thousands of ideas to try different things, to try to make this happen, knowing that only one or two of them will we'll make the change that we're looking for, but for us to be the driving force and energy of that movement. Thank you so much, Haysen. Yes. That's all I have to say to that is yes. Other thoughts from the audience? Yes. This is Laura, and I would say a, a place where I have seen theater more integrated would be Canada. So in Canada, I think there's, there's a lot more funding for theater, and there, it's a lot more inclusive, where you can have a theater company that's doing main stage productions and has a touring children's show and is working with the elders in their community and is working with the indigenous population of their community, creating pieces on the bus, creating pieces outside. I mean, they're, they're, because there's so much funding, they're not bound by ticket sales, they're not bound by you know, four week rehearsal periods and they can create a lot more interesting programs that go out into the community in a lot of different ways. So there are some of the things that you were talking before about how can we bring theater to people who can't afford to come in? Well, they're doing that. That's a really good point, Laura. And, um, and there, I want two people here to speak about a little bit about um, some aspects of that because uh, funding also came up in our previous uh, panel in this series, Reimagined Black Theater, where um, Black leaders shared a lot of incredible insight if you haven't seen that panel. Um, and uh, the idea of equitable funding came up today and it came up last time as well um, and is so crucial. So I'd love for Manny to share a little bit about what's happening in his world as well as this idea of, um, of, of equity in theater. Um, we haven't talked about the public works program, but this is why NG is, is, um, is facilitating um, this, the philosophy of the public works program at Seattle Rep and across the nation and 
internationally, um, it, it, I feel like speaks to that, what you just brought up as well, Laura. Um, yeah, Manny, would you, can you share a little bit? Sure, well, you know, I mean, one thing we, we all know is that these are really challenging times. I mean, my gosh, I, don't, I feel like I have to find a whole new um, dictionary to find the words that really capture <laughs> what we're going through because I use words I feel like gosh no it's, 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 it's there's another nuance there these are challenging times and our organizations are really struggling theaters museums uh, orchestra symphonies all of the music bands um individual artists our creative you know, all of our creative folks and um and uh and right now um in a crisis and in, in, in a global pandemic I mean that shut all of us down we you know uh, you know, somebody said it, one of my, another partner said the other day, the only place really where there's money that will give us the support that we need are the people that print it. It's federal government, right? Um, because no one's doing well. No one is healthy financially. And, um, but, and I know that, that it has been very disheartening to see the lack of um, agreement on a, on any more COVID relief. But I, I think that we just, we got to get through this. Um, um, we will now get through this. We look with great anticipation to the election next week. Everyone vote, <laughs> and um, and then uh, and uh, and then resources will start to you know conversations will start again. The federal government and resources will start to pour in. And here's where this thing could really flip. That um, the, the, uh, you know the silver lining is is that things are so dire that there's a that there could be a lot of different ways that resources will come to the creative sector. Um, there's a great proposal, it, it, not just PPP funds and unemployment, which is really super important, literally our priorities right now, um, but also money that could pour in from the state government, right? Maybe even from the city and from the county, because all those will all be recipients of federal aid. And um, and there'll be a real focus on, on trying to inspire all the things that make theater happen, which is like people getting out of their homes, people wanting to connect with each other, right? Um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and right now uh, there's a few ideas around how to put creative workers to work. And maybe the way that we uh, take a look at it on the Americans for the Arts website, there's a, a putting creative workers to work proposal. And, but imagine that maybe, how do we do that here in Washington? How do we put creative workers to work with whatever this new WPA kind of program is? Maybe what we do is we make sure that we get that those creative people and we embed them in all this, in, in every aspect of civic life, right? We get them on the utility boards. We get them in every neighborhood. Every neighborhood has artists and residents. I, you know, how do we put creative people to work? This is our opportunity when there are new resources. I have to put on my optimistic hat right now. When there are new resources that we make transformative change. We put artists in really different places. We, 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 we push open doors, we climb in through the window, you know, and we make sure that creativity is, you know, is part of the solution. And again, and we do it in a way that is relevant to our communities because the artists that are involved, the communities we are speaking to fully reflect our society, you know, and, and, and with, with a real emphasis also uh, uh, to redistribute wealth by recognizing that you know, Black, Indigenous people of color, communities, artists have not had their fair share of resources. And, and, um, and this is how we can turn that around. So, um, so uh, nothing really specific now, but I just say, um, you know, there's, we're at a precipice. Um, again, we have to look to the federal government because they print money. And therefore we got to make sure that the people who print that money are really thinking big and broad and are going to lean forward with resources for us to invest in it. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> It just sucks that we need money, <laughs> you know? What else is social construct? That money is social construct also. And, mm -hmm. you know, I wish there was different ways to do things and change the way we look at money somehow. It, it's back to what yeah. Sarah said, which is we, we actually, we actually need to move away from a capitalistic society where everything is geared on money. Yeah. But just as of right here and right now, I mean, people have rent to pay and they're and artists, you know, and, and we want to keep our artists and, 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 and people need, you know, so yeah, um, but I agree with you. 
I think this conversation actually um, makes me think of some of the work that you're doing, Kathy, um, and have done for quite some time. And I know we're running low on time, but can you speak a little bit about the the racial equity work that you've been doing with grant makers and funders? I just feel like that's such critical work to this part of the discussion. Yeah, I mean, it, there's so much, but in a nutshell, um, when I when I was put into the position I am in now, which is to manage the grant funding programs for the Office of Arts and Culture, I knew that I could. I was not willing to accept the job unless we could redo it through a racial equity lens. So part of the logic model for our funding um, for the last decade has really been how do we use our funding as leverage to create a more anti-racist arts and cultural sector? And that starts with self-interrogation of each and every organization um, in order to uh, qualify to even get funding, they actually need to do a racial equity self-assessment and then work with our office in terms of really developing out how they actually move the needle for themselves, um, their staff, their board, their artists, um, who they're even hiring as artists and the kind of work that they're putting on stage. And of course, everyone's starting from a different place. So the goal was to first just help people move more towards being that. This next year, we're, we just sent out the letter today, in fact, um, uh, moving even more intentionally that way, um, um, our, our, uh, including our, our funding. We've been bridging this the old hierarchy of funding, um, uh, which is basically how long people had been funded. Um, and now we're moving completely to just the scores that they're getting, um, because I've been able to shift enough stuff where the scoring actually does reflect all the uh, organizations representing um, people of the global majority are getting the highest scores now um, um, because of our shift in criteria and 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 centering in the the racial equity trainings we've been doing for the whole community um, that we can now sh move to that model of funding so uh and we're we're and i'm working with a lot of national leaders um, as well as canadian leaders um, in terms of how we can all do this together because if we're the only office who's doing this um, there's so much more funding out there for everybody than what we can provide. It's not going to be enough leverage. So we actually need to partner with everyone in the community to really make this shift. But it's it's for the intention of if we become more anti-racist, which is really about how we become more relational and center human beings, like what Mickey was talking about before. How do we center people over systems and profit? Um, um, and, and that's really what being anti-racist means. It's where we can all show up as authentically as possible, where we're not privileging some over everybody, but by centering those who have not um, had as much access or resources or um, um, anything before, uh, which the protests have been daylighting, um, um, it actually makes things better for everybody. It's just like with access, ADA access, if you center people with disabilities and what is preventing people from having access to events and spaces, then actually those spaces become accessible for everybody, regardless if it's because you have a disability or because you're elderly or because of whatever issue, right? So the more we can actually really create um, a focus on who has had the least access in whatever re for whatever reason and make things better for them, then everybody benefits. Um, and that's what we need to do as a country now. And it's been daylighted and, and we cannot go back like this has opened up our, I, as Mickey was talking about, um, and as Christiana was talking about, we now have a lens to what is true in our society. We cannot step back from that again, because, and, and we can only move forward and we have to. So vote. Thank you, Kathy. That is such a great way to wrap up this conversation. I, I feel like there are so many more ideas in the um, among the attendees, continue those conversations um, with your with your family and friends and communities, please. Um, uh, our next conversation as part of this panel is Reimagine Indigenous Theater, where Indigenous leaders will be joining us um, to share their thoughts. And before that, um, as part of Seattle Reps Kilroy's Club, which is our play reading club, we will be reading Larissa Fast Horses, What Would Crazy Horse Do? Uh, so two events to look forward to. Um, but especially an event to look forward to is November 3rd. Make sure to vote. Please make a voting plan. Um, and um, let's make this vision of theater happen. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, attendees, and thank you, panelists.